Welcome to the Leap of Fate podcast with your boy, your host, Randy Silver. We have a special guest today, one of my best friends. You know him from the podcast multiple times, Mark Wooding of After School YouTube channel and Instagram account. Mark, welcome to the podcast. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. Do you know why you're here today? I think this is a special number, right? Does the audience know why they're here today? Tell us why they're here. This is episode 100. Let me say it one more time. Episode 100. It only took us nine months from episode 99 to 100, but we made it. We're here for episode 100, and we have a very special update in my life that I want to share with the audience today and talk about. I felt like it would be more beneficial in the way of the storytelling of the podcast and be more beneficial to the audience for you to take key takeaways and understand why we're here today to have Mark moderate the podcast and talk because he's a big influence on me. You've seen him and I on this episodes on podcast talk a lot and there's nobody else. Maybe one of the person shout out Sean Leventon. We got in a thread on uh, who else we would want to be on better than that. I would love Mark to be the <clears throat> moderator for today to share the special moment in my life and how it can help you make that special moment in your life. That was really nice. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I just want to return the sentiment. You have really inspired me. I mean, I just started my podcast and you were pushing me to start a podcast. I've enjoyed all our conversations and uh, I just love your ambition and how you bring people together. So I really appreciate your energy and I'm very excited for your, your journey ahead of you. And I, I want to hear about it. Awesome. So before we dive into my journey, can you tell people about your podcast and just kind of after school again, so they get a fresh reminder? Yeah. Um, after school is kind of like this intuitive animation channel where I cover philosophy, science, history, anything. And I just started a podcast, um, kind of cause I had this cool opportunity to talk to all these interesting people. And I figured, you know, I don't really have a, a, stra a strategy for the podcast, but it's kind of just, it's kind of like you, you know, I'm just mm -hmm. talking to whoever. Yep. And really it's, it's about like being curious and, and pulling that thread of curiosity and seeing where it takes you, you know, what's the name of the podcast? The Before School Podcast. The Before School Podcast. The, Good name. The BS Podcast. And how can they find it? <laughs> uh, on YouTube right now. Awesome. So you can go in the links. You'll be able to see it. And one thing that Mark and I talked about was exactly what he said is he gets to bring so many people on to the after school part. It'd be cool to interview them about their thought process. Just talk about life, their, their history, and them shoot the shit together. And I think people will be really interested. You already got over 10,000 followers on YouTube. People are really enjoying it. And, you know, Mark's never maybe been the most outwardly social person. Obviously, he uh, doesn't show his face a lot on after school. So for him to take that leap of fate on himself to start the podcast is a big step for him. And uh, I know it's going to be extremely successful. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Like, I, I don't think that I'm a great podcaster, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't start because in a year I'll be looking back at what I'm doing now and I'll probably cringe, but you're not going to be perfect when you start. So it's kind of just like start and see where it goes. Yep. And his first guest was Rashad Evans, UFC fighter, legend, hall of famer. So yeah. go check it out. It's nothing about UFC to talk about. Talk about mushrooms a lot. <laughs> well, it's fun. It's funny. Cause he kind of pushed me into starting it. He was really the catalyst cause he was like, let's have a conversation and record it. And I, I was like, well, I don't, that's not really what I do. He's like, just start a podcast. And I was like, I have been thinking about having a podcast and how am I supposed to say no to like the UFC champ, you know? Yep. Yes. So yeah. Don't tap out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is a good segue that we can let's hear into why we're here today. Let's get into your story though. Yes. That's why we're here. Leap of fate episode 100. Yes, sir. Why did you wait nine months? from episode 99 to getting to 100. Episode 100 and anything you do in life, if you do it 100 times, it's a huge accomplishment. Say it's 100 workouts, uh, Peloton, spin cycle, soul cycle, uh, you'd go X, Y, Z 100 times. It's a big accomplishment, accomplishment, excuse me. You're moving from double digits to triple digits. And then obviously from triple digits to four digits, you gotta go another, uh, Quite a bit. <laughs> Quite a bit. Another 900 times. It's yeah. going to take you a while. So I wanted the episode 100 to be really meaningful. I wanted it to be something in my life. 
I then want to bring someone else on to talk about their accomplishment or something because I accomplished a hundred to get here. What it was it take to make the podcast? I did everything myself. I do everything myself. So finding the guests, doing the editing, doing the uploading to YouTube, the SEO work, creating the clips on for social media, for Instagram, for YouTube shorts, for TikTok hours for me to do it. You know, I worked at Oyster as a nine to five per se, go to the gym for an hour or two, decompress, come back, and then worked in the podcast YouTube channel from 7 p.m. to about 1 a.m. I was doing that six days a week, mentally grueling, physically grueling to a degree. And for me to sum up to episode 100, I wanted to be something special and perfect. And it took me nine months to get there. I always knew I wanted to do 100. Obviously, I don't want to stop on 99. That kind of sucks. But I wanted 100 to be perfect. And it needed to be something that I accomplished for myself to make it meaningful for you, my Loft audience who've been with me this whole journey, to see how Loft impacted me. Because I know how much it impacted all you out there. And you've talked about that on Instagram, over YouTube, uh, sitting, hitting me up, texting me, my friends, my family, of the guests I brought on, how they made an impact, such as Mark helping people pursue their dreams. And I needed to make an impact for you to get the same accomplishment for me, I felt like. You know, I've done some solo episodes. You know, Mark, before we hopped on here, talked about the episode I talked about dating during the pandemic, where I dated a girl who was a clown. Then I know that at the time until she told me in the middle <laughs> of dating. And then someone else who somewhat stalkered me a little bit. Uh, and I've done other solo episodes where I talked about, you know, rest in peace, Alice, where she got hit by a drunk driver and passed away. And I ran a half marathon in her honor with a group of friends. So I've done solo stuff that hopefully have made an impact in your life. It's made an impact in my life. For episode 100, I wanted to wait until I had something as impactful of something like that to move forward. And uh, here we are. We're, we're at that point. <clears throat> well said. Uh, 100 episodes, that's a big accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. And what, what kept you going? Well, let me ask you this before we all answer that question. How yeah. many are you at for after school? How many? I'm at four. Hundred. No, no, oh, not no. for the podcast. Oh, for... How many? How many after school videos have you released? Close to two hundred. Close to two hundred. Yeah. So you've almost doubled that, which is impressive. Yeah, to well... think about. So you understand the accomplishment of doing something a hundred times in the sense of the creation that goes mm. into it. Well, what I was going to say is what I really admire about you is that we kind of live in a culture where we want that instant gratification. And I, I'm definitely guilty of this. I, there was a point where I wanted to be a DJ. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to a festival and seeing a DJ up there on stage and he's like raising his hand and all the lights and the fireworks are going off and everybody's worshiping him, the, the DJ. And I'm like, I want that. And then I come to find out that DJing is a lot of work and you have to learn how to produce music and you have to you know, what you're seeing on that stage is the very, very tip of the iceberg. What you're not seeing is all the long nights and hard work and thousands of hours that went into getting to that point. Yeah. But I think we have a tendency to see the person on top of the mountain and say, I want to be up there, but we don't want to do the work to get to the top of that mountain. What I really admire about you is you kind of, you had so many opportunities to quit. And I really admire that you just kind of put your head down and just kept grinding you're so yep. like you have so much perseverance and i really respect I, that i appreciate that there is a point i think it was around episode 85 i had not missed a week of the podcast so we did every week for 85 episodes which puts you at basically a year and a half almost two years so that's impressive and then they tapered off life got busy things happen and that's not an excuse and you know i wasn't going to put out content that did not hit the standards i wanted to hit and that's not, I don't want to devalue as my listener to be like, oh, he's dropping off. No, that's not who I am. High standards, which hmm. takes us to why we're here today. So can we get the drum roll? What's the name of the podcast? Leap of Fate. Leap of Fate. And I am taking the leap of fate on myself. I have quit my job at Oyster. Uh, we'll talk about that in a couple minutes. And I am moving from San Diego, California to Orlando, Florida. And I am going back to school at 30 years old to pursue a career in sports broadcasting at the Dan Patrick School of Sports Casting in Full State University in Orlando, Florida. I start the school June 25th. Today is April 19th. Happy almost 420. Uh, <laughs> and I will be moving out of my apartment in San Diego, May 31st, hang out at my parents' house for a couple weeks. And then mid-June, I will move into Orlando, Florida. 
you know, be attending school. It's a 20 month program year round. So there's no like some break, no like winter breaks, things like that. It's a trade school. So they focus on specific degrees such as uh, in sports, in media, in entertainment, in music, in uh, video games. So you get a very specific degree such as sports casting or sports management or sports marketing. It's not like you go to school and you get a business degree, you get an economic degree. So it's very specific is run by uh, Dan Patrick and a crew of former ESPN head honchos who started this program to get people into the sports field. It's a very unique program. Uh, I've known for a couple of years. I've been following about it since pre-pandemic, but it just didn't make sense probably in the pandemic with all the restrictions happening to kind of move and see what would happen. So I wanted to make sure that everything was kind of back to normal to get the most out of the program and the move. And I'm really excited to go to the program what does the program offer, you may ask? They have a full on studio. So for someone like me, and we'll talk about like my whole dreams, um, you know, I've done podcasting, I've done YouTube, but I've never been inside a real TV studio. So they have a full TV studio and they teach you in front of the camera, behind the camera. So some of the classes you take are uh, how to cut a reel, how to do a two minute interview with a person coming off of a field like an athlete. How do you sit in front of a sports desk and you read a teleprompter? Uh, they teach you public speaking. They teach you how to video edit. They teach you how to run a camera. So you, you get all the skills that go into creating a 30 minute sports on their newscast, how to create a 30 minute local news. So you get to learn the behind the camera and front of the camera. In addition, they have a partnership with the D2 school locally where you get to be the color commentator for their sports games, football, basketball, softball, uh, baseball, etc. You get to interview the athletes. So you get real world experience there. Finally, they also have partnerships with the different sports leagues, uh, live golf, PGA, NFL, NBA, uh, MLS, etc. And you get to go work those events and, you know, maybe you're not color content in the game. Fair enough. They have national broadcasters there, but you get to go work the event as a reporter and do and cut like a 30 second reel and do things like that. So they're giving you all this real world experience. And by the end of the program, if you've done it correctly, you you know, you should one, have a lot of connections and networking from the instructors there. Two, have a really good reel that will put you in the opportunity to get hired outside of school. And then three is they bring a lot of people in to speak, such as Dan Patrick himself, Scott Van Pelt, other prominent sports center anchors, other prominent people in the field who come talk to you because they have those connections and come in. So for someone who at 30 years old, does it make sense for me to go back to say University of Texas, say Ohio State and be a four year student and start my bachelor's all over again? Or do I do an accelerated program that's 20 months and really get a focused, censored uh, school ship? It made the most sense. Hmm. So can you take us through that moment? Was it a moment where you decided to do this huge shift in your life? Like, or was it a kind of a gradual decision to get to this? Yeah, well, what I will say is uh, I have a girlfriend uh, she's amazing. Her name is Mary. Hi, Mary. Shout out, Mary. Shout out, Mary. I love you. She's been the amazing support system. She, We've been dating for uh, almost a year now, and she's been the most vocal to me about supporting me and wanting me to follow my dreams and wants me to be happy. And so I've told her about this in, the, in some bypassing. And finally, she's like, hey, if you need to go two steps back, three steps forward, and if that means you got to move somewhere to make this happen, you know, I want to be with you and I want to support you in your endeavors and your dreams. And um, I'm willing to uproot my life to make sure that we can be together if you need to uproot your life to make it happen. So that gave me a lot of confidence to make the decision. Uh, so Mary, thank you so much. I love you. Uh, but this really started when I was probably five years old. <laughs> if you take it back, uh, if you know me, I'm a sports guy, been in sports my whole life, played sports, talk about sports. When I'm not working, like my tech jobs, it's been sports, watching sports, playing sports, talking sports. So I've always told myself, if I could put the product on the field, if I could watch the product on the field and comment on it, if I could write about the product in the field and then talk about it to me, that would never be working a day in my life. So long story short, if I could have a job in sports and be getting paid to watch sports and then talk about it, that would be the dream job for me. I went to UC Santa Cruz, which is not a big sports school. There weren't a lot of opportunities to maybe break into that field there. Out of school, you know, 
the ultimate goal is to you know get a job and start earning some wealth for yourself create a savings account went then to san francisco that's where i met mark he also went to san francisco as well go banana sucks and you know i was a tech sales job as a sales rep and then i moved into sales management i did sales management at multiple different companies for about 10 years now that i'm 30 and it was great it provided me a really good life i was able to travel the world uh, I was able to travel for business and pleasure, able to make amazing friends in SF, be able to move down to San Diego, met some amazing people I work with who are some of my best friends, who are mentors, who are peers. I had a really, really good life at work, but it was a standard nine to five text job behind a computer and uh, openly, it wasn't fulfilling. I, Cisco is a great company, great to work for, but I don't wake up every day caring about selling tech hardware or cybersecurity. Oyster is an amazing company to work for. Uh, great work culture, great mission, but transparently, I don't wake up every day wanting to sell HR tech. And there's a point, and this is something that Sean Levinton really talked about, was like, you can only do something so much until you're going to get either bored of it, you're going to get tired of it, or it's either way that you're doing it because you're unfulfilled about it. And you're going to stop doing it, or you're not going to want to do it, or, in, or your performance is going to decline because you're not in it anymore and your heart's not in it. So I would say the past, probably starting early pandemic, like right before it, when I was still at Cisco, I had that feeling. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go into sports. But then the pandemic happened, everything shuts down. You know, a lot of us, what would we do? Hey, we got to work remotely from home. Things change. Not really trying to make a big life move during the pandemic, uh, not knowing the restrictions, what may happen and whatnot. Now that we're in 2023, you know, most of the things are back open, the world's back to being relatively normal, uh, whatever normal is. Uh, the opportunity is now is out there to make the move. So I've been thinking about it for quite a while. And I would say early to mid winter is when I started applying to schools. I had known full sale for a couple of years and it was on my top of the list. And when I got in, I was like, okay, this is, I'm ready to make this leap of faith on myself. Wow. Thank you for sharing that whole story. And I look at you as a guy who really has a great circle of friends. You have very, like, no offense, it looks like you have a very comfortable life. Mm -hmm. Like I do. You, Humble, you have, like, your workout routine. You have your girlfriend. You have all these friends. You live in this awesome place. Life's good, right? Mm -hmm. why, why, why shake it up? Do you, do you know who Twitch is? No. I want to say his name is Twitch. If I'm saying his name wrong, I apologize. He was a DJ for Ellen DeGeneres. Uh, amazing family. Uh, DJ for a TV show. He was on So You Think You Can Dance. Like really well-known musician, uh, dance guy in Hollywood. He committed suicide earlier this year or late last year. Uh, he went, he left his house, left everything out of his house, went to a hotel and unfortunately um, committed suicide inside the hotel room. They found him the day after. He had clinical depression. They had no idea. His wife didn't know. His kids didn't know. Nothing. And to the outside, he had this amazing world. And he committed suicide. And so you're like, why would he do that? Like, why would he be that unhappy to think that? I am not at that level. Uh, I'm not um, depressed. But I understand now that I look back at it, where he may have come from, where it may seem like, as you just said, everything's comfortable. You're right. But you're not internally happy with yourself or internally fulfilled. And it was eating away at me. I was sitting at work and it would be star work at eight o'clock and then nine 15. I'm like, I still have seven hours left of this. I don't want to set the computer the next seven hours. I'm in the meeting and I'm daydreaming and I'm in the meeting. I'm putting sports on my computer, to watch highlights. When I should be focusing on work and that's doing a disservice to the people I'm working with because I'm not hundred percent into it. This is doing the service to the business. I'm not hundred percent into it. It's doing a disservice to myself because why am I going to sit and do something the next 30 years of my life, I'm 60 and look back and be like, I just wasted my time. Yay, I'm getting a paycheck uh, to take a vacation every eight weeks to go to Hawaii with my girlfriend, which is great, I love it. But am I gonna sit there and be in agony mentally and not happy with where I'm doing at work eight weeks a year, I mean, consistently, mo mainly for a vacation here and there? There are some people like, you come from poverty or you come from, you need money and you got to do what you got to get money. And I completely understand that when I came out of college, I was in that route. I had less than like $200 in my bank account. Like I needed money. 
I'm so blessed to say that I've worked my ass off and I've created enough savings where I can take myself out of the workforce for 20 months to have to pay out of pocket all myself. I'm not taking loans or anything for college, which is going to deplete everything I've ever saved in my life to take me back toward that, to that point of where there's going to be very little savings and I need to get a job out of this school and replenish what I build up for myself. So I know the effect it's going to have on me to go three steps back to hopefully take me five steps forward to I'm at that point where I don't feel like I'm uh, doing a job just to do a job. I'm doing... Well, the, the economy and the culture and the civilization is changing faster and faster. And what you made me think about is like our great-grandparents' generation, <clears throat> they would work one job their entire life. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty good. And, and not only their entire life, but then their next generation would probably work that job too. So if your dad was a blacksmith, the son would be a blacksmith. And mm -hmm. the next son, you'd have a family for as many generations as you can look back. And they were all blacksmiths, you know? Yep. And then about 100 years ago, people started to kind of like move around the country, move to factories. And there was a lot of switching. And then probably our parents' generation, people would switch careers maybe once in their entire life. And then the millennial generation, I think I saw that there's an average of five switches really? in their career. Interesting. <clears throat> and I think with the younger, like now it, it's people switch every two years. And I think that speaks to just how fast things are changing. When you say switch, like switching <clears throat> jobs switch, or switching yeah. careers? Switch, what? like you used to work at one company, one role, your whole life. Got it. And now you're just like jumping ship constantly. And I don't, I don't blame people for that, but you know, the idea that you're gonna just graduate with a degree and use that degree at one place and stay there for 40 years, that idea is kind of gone, mm -hmm. you know? And I think I commend you because, because we do live in that, that kind of rapidly changing world. <laughs> Things are, are changing faster and faster. You kind of have to just like bet on yourself and do what you really want to do and pursue that. Because if you kind of like shoot for something that, you know, your heart's not into it, you could fail at that too. So you yeah. might as well shoot for what you want to do and fail. And I agree. Yeah. And the good part where I'm at now is say I shoot for this and I fail. I have 10 years of tech sales and management in my background. I have a good falling back to Now am I going to get to the same level? Maybe I got to take a step back and not be a global manager, just a regional manager because I've been out of the game for a couple of years, but I have a solid backing to have a fail safe if I need to. Hmm. I think it's really smart you're going into sports as well because while everything is changing very rapidly, sports is kind of like this it's on steady the be beacon. Like it's the one thing in our society that is like kind of stayed constant, you know? In and consistent, constant, but also with the advent of streaming nowadays, you look at Amazon has a Thursday night football game on. YouTube just got the rights NFL Sunday ticket. You Football, I mean, uh, bidding for the streaming TV rights, if you call it, the rights to broadcast a sports game are getting higher and higher by the year, meaning that the interest is there for the companies that won't have to bid that high because they know how much money they'll make off of it. So sports are only getting more integrated in our life. And we saw that in the pandemic when everything was shut down. What was the one consistent or constant that still happened? was sports yeah it was behind like closed doors and no fans but it was the one thing that could still go on that allowed us to get out of the psyche for a couple of hours and just focus that supporting your team why do you think people like sports this goes back actually to the question of why i started leap of fate which is interesting do you remember why i started leap of fate no no so charles barkley during the pandemic like again very beginning is when i started leap of fate was on television talking about how 99% of the world life suck. Maybe this is a big number. Like, let's say 95%. Uh, their life sucks. They hate their life. They hate whatever they're doing, where they live, whatever is going on. They dislike it and it creates sadness in their life and unfulfillment. For two, three hours a day, when your favorite sports team is playing or any sports are on, whatever, you're not in your day-to-day -day anymore and you're in this world watching. And all you care about is the sport team and the passion that you have for that or just watching the game and you don't have to worry about anything else. With the pandemic happening, all sports shut down, you realize your life sucks and there's nothing and you just sit there and you're like, there's nothing taking me away and you just are more depressed and sad because your life really sucks. 
I thought that was an extremely pessimistic mindset and the pessimistic way to see life, which is why I created the leap of fate with the concept of how do people overcome adversity? How do people turn their life around? Or how do they make something with self-empowerment? And that's why we brought on all these amazing guests who talked about not how life sucks or how their mindset sucks. Hey, you can overcome that if you've set your mind to it and you have the right goals. And it's not going to happen easy. You take steps, but that's how you get there. To answer the actual legit question, I'm not a politician. I'm not going to round about you. Uh, I think people love sports because uh, it gives you something as a community to root for as a community. So let's just use here in San Diego. What are the teams that we have? You got uh, the minor league hockey team, San Diego goals. Games are super fun to go to. Do I watch them on TV? No, but I get to go there. For a basketball team, we don't have one, so people support the Lakers or the Clippers. The Clippers used to be here. If you look at the football team, used to be the Chargers. They're now up in LA, so mm, suck you guys. Uh, and then you got the uh, soccer teams. You got the San Diego Loyal, who are cool. There may be an MLS team coming here. You got the San Diego Wave, the women's soccer team, which are amazing. They're so good. And then you got the biggest team in town, which is the baseball team, the San Diego Padres. And so it gives you that community one, to talk about sports with people who also like-minded watching on TV. You go to the game, gives you something to do, activity, fun, before the game, after the game. Uh, when they play other cities, you can go to other cities where your swag, it gives you opportunity to travel. Uh, and then obviously if they win the championship, you have the, the pride. So it gives you a sense of belonging, a sense of community, no matter where you are. Say I, when I moved to Orlando, I can still be a Padres fan. I can go out there and rep the Padres and be like, I'm a Padres person. Sorry, I'm not going to become a Miami Marlins fan. And it gives you that sense of belonging community no matter where you're at, which is why you see uh, people repping sports all the time because it gives you that sense of community and that locality of where you're from or where you live. Well said. And another thing I think sports really provides is uh, hope. Like you were saying, a lot of people are demoralized out there. And if you talk to people who are huge sports fans, like huge football fans, every single one of them believes that their team is like one player away from the Super Bowl. You know, mm -hmm. it can be the worst team from last season. They all have this idea that, oh, we're gonna draft this player and we're gonna be in the playoffs and we're gonna. I think the NFL, especially, has been so good at, at selling their fans on hope because everybody believes that, you know, you're one they have away. this hope. Whereas, like, who wants to watch a, a sport where you know that you're probably not gonna win? Like, your team's, your team, who wants to watch their team lose every game? Well, look at the Oakland yeah. A's this season. They average. There was one day, like it was like the first week of the season, they had 3,000 fans in the stands as a major league team, 3,000 fans. The team is not good. Everyone knows it. Nine minor league teams, minor league teams, so not major league teams, minor league teams had more fans in the stands that day than the Oakland A's. That's wild to think about. A minor league team, nine of them had more fans than a major league team in the stadium. And you know why? Because they have no hope. They know the team sucks. Uh, it's played that the team sucks. So why am I going to spend my money to support something that there's no hope or, you know, fair enough, it's not going to be a fun product to watch and like my time's used better somewhere else. Yeah. And just to transition, I think the best business people, the best marketing campaigns are ones that are more about an idea rather than the product itself. Like if you look at Apple or McDonald's, they're selling an emotion or a belief in, in something and everybody in the company that works for the company and the customers buy into that belief and they don't even talk about their product you know like mcdonald's for example we love to see you smile this is a happy meal you kind of attribute it with you come here and we're, we're selling happiness here mm. we're selling a happy experience and everybody kind of like we're not concerned about the calories or where the burger's from or at least the people that eat there are not mm-hmm Ba, 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 ba. Um, yeah, so I'm very, very it. rarely do you see good marketing talk about the product itself. It, it talks about, it gets you emotional and then it sells you on that emotion. That's so if you point. can get people emotional, you can always capitalize on that. Yeah. And that goes back to being a, a good sportscaster. How do you get people when you're color commenting a game or doing the report on it to be invested in the product that you're uh, talking about or that you're showing the clips? 100%. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So what is the ultimate goal with this venture? Great question. The ultimate goal for me, as I said, would be if I could be the person getting paid to watch the game, then I made my dream. So 
ideally initially it would be three things and i think any of them three i'd be extremely happy with one color commentator so what is a color commentator it's the person calling the game doing the play-by-play uh the analyst is usually the former athlete unfortunately i'm not a former af- professional athlete so it's not me so if we use some of the most well-known people jim nance cbs you guys know him he calls the pga stuff he calls ncaa basketball he calls nfl he's the number one person for so he gets to commentate all these different sports so he knows all the different sports he's really knowledgeable then they'll have an analyst who will be the person who call, talks about the more of the x and o's of the game and so the, the ultimate Whatever. goal is to be like jim nance yeah that so, would be number one so Color let me comments. let me be devil's advocate for let me be the the person that's like scared for your future for a sec okay i'll I'll be like your scared aunt so okay randy there's only one jim nance Mm -hmm. maybe you know the there's eight billion people on earth and there's one jim nance okay you have a very safe job you have retirement you have benefits you're gonna you're shooting for the stars Mm -hmm. what do you say to your aunt I have a funny answer, and then I would then the serious answer. The funny answer is, well, there's only one Jim Nance for the CBS network, but then there's also NBC, there's ESPN, there's Fox, there's streaming, there's a cornucopia of networks out there. There's also other ways to go about it where you're a TV studio host, where you're doing the same thing. So Jim Nance is just one person in the whole field, so there's more out there. But two, nobody ever accomplished their dreams and goals by playing it safe. Everyone had to take the leap and the risk on the, at some point to make it happen. Fair enough, some people uh, are born into a lineage or a you know, family name that they have more doors open to allow that to happen, to break in. I'm not a part of that. And for me to be able to do that, I have so much self-belief and confidence in myself that I'm taking, the, I'm taking that risk in myself to go back to school in the field that I wanna be in because I have not done that and learn the skills there and create the network for me to then have the baseline for me to go into that. Fair enough. Maybe I'll start out in El Paso, Texas or Bakersfield, California. And you know, you're not in a big media market or a big company. You got to work your way up. And I have the self-belief myself. And from uh, talking to people who've given me the self-belief as well, that uh, I'm pretty good at it and I'll make it happen. That's awesome. <clears throat> yeah. One thing that, that hopefully can be motivate you is that there's a lot less competition to do extraordinary things. There's only a few people on earth that want to be an astronaut. Like if you wanted to be the best elephant trainer on earth, how many people are trying to be the best elephant trainer on earth? Like five people. (laughs) So like all you have to do is beat out those five other people and you're the best. Whereas if you're trying to be an accountant or a lawyer, there's how many millions of accountants and lawyers do we have? Quite. So I think you are orienting yourself towards a goal where Yes, the, the chances are, are difficult, but there's also a lot less competition. Yeah. So, and yeah. you're like, people say they want to do it, but no one's taking that. They're not taking that step. I'm taking the first step in the right direction. Oh, yeah. Have, have uh, any of your family members or friends kind of expressed concern and said, I, I think you're making the wrong yeah. move? So this is a good question. So let me monologue this for a second, if that's okay. I was very nervous to make the move. As you mentioned, you know, I live a very comfortable life in San Diego. We have a big friend group out here. Shout out to everybody. Love y'all. And it's hard to leave them. It's hard to leave what you know, the routine, the day-to-day, the friendship, to move across the country or move anywhere, fair enough, where you know nobody. And it's going to be by you or just you and your girlfriend. And you got to start a new life together. But there's been millions of people who have done that. If it's... Uh, going from one city to another, from one country to another, people leaving war, leaving famine, uh, leaving strife in their country to try to find a better life in a different country. And you do what you got to do to make the best life for yourself. And for me, this to me is making the best life for myself is taking this opportunity for a career change. Not that I'm comparing myself to someone who's leaving a war-torn country. Not I'm not trying to say that. But the concept of like, you got to, when you get to where you go, you will make the life for yourself that you want. So it was really, that's where my mindset was like, and my friends will support me and my family will support me. And they're like, hey, uh, if you think this is best for you, you know, we may have our own opinion, but we're going to be happy for you and wish you the best and get to support you. So everyone said the nicest things. No, work, 
uh, it was bittersweet to say goodbye to my team, uh, all the fellow oyster people, especially the people I managed directly, uh, you know, teared up a bit. It was sad. They're going to be in a great spot. Uh, I'm really excited to see them continue to grow and how the company will be successful. But they've all were like, it's a big loss. We're going to miss you. Uh, it's going to be tough to replace you. The the value you bring, the ROI you bring, um, it's, it's irreplaceable. So one, you know, it's great to hear that and to know the impact that you make. And two, it also just makes it harder to make that decision. Um, but again, having the conviction in yourself, I know I'm making the best decision for myself. And the friends were, were wise. Everyone was super supportive. And I think the most interesting thing I heard, which I was least expecting about, which is probably the big topic that I want you and you to know is you can make the same choice for yourself. It doesn't have to be move across country career change, but a lot of people come to me and say like, I'm not happy at my job. I'm not happy with this. I'm happy with that. And it's rewarding to hear someone make that change who I know. And it's not a small change you're doing. You're dropping a really good job. You're changing your whole life to go across the country, to go three steps back, to go five steps forward. I've been thinking about that. I just haven't had the courage or the charisma to do it. And to see someone who we know is successful do that and feel vulnerable and open up and share that and then make that change helps me feel comfortable knowing that I can make that change for myself and do it. Uh, so thank you for sharing your message. Um, you know, if I did it off a LinkedIn post or talking to people or two, but like just vicariously, like seeing you do it helps make an impact on me to be successful, which is why we're here today is that got me to how episode hundred would be perfect is sharing this message out to the leap of faith fans or any silver fans out there on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, all that good, good for you and you and Mark to make that change for yourself and know that um, if you need someone to look to who's a bit scared, a bit nervous, um, but is extremely, extremely confident in his decision and know that in 20 years, we'll be looking back at this and saying, I can't believe that's when we told the world and look where I'm at now. Uh, I'm going to be extremely successful and I have absolutely zero doubts that I'm ever going to fail. It's very inspiring. Have you tried reaching out to any of these folks that you admire, like this Bob Nance or what's his name? Jim Nance. Jim Nance. Have you tried reaching out to the people that you look up to? I have, but I don't have any of those connections. So LinkedIn has probably been the most uh, advantageous way to do it. So I wasn't able to do it, like get connected to any of these people, unfortunately. Uh, I don't have a lot of celebrity type of people in my life. Um, my parents are like people around me are not that connected to maybe help. However, for this program specifically, I did do a really good job at connecting with Gus Ramsey, who's the director of many professors, as I mentioned, the alumni who hmm. come from the program. And they were able to give me what it's like day in the life, successes from the program, how the program sets you up for post-school, getting jobs, what you do in school with the internships that they provide and the networking opportunities. So that helped me really say, hey, this is the program to go to. And then they also were like, hey, this is how we're different than say a traditional four-year school or if you go to a graduate school for specific sports journalism and whatnot and how we're a bit different because it's more trade school focused versus a standard four year mm. for someone who's at 30 is better for me. The demographic of the people who go there, the average age of someone is 25 to 35, probably going for their second career because they didn't know A, this program was offered or B, same situation as me. Hey, not the most happy in their current job. I want to break into in the new field. That's more my passion. So they're like, Hey, you're actually like the average right there in the middle of the a demographic that we see and yeah well one thing that i was thinking is it's it's pretty interesting how if you reach out to like five people that you really admire even if they seem like they're a big celebrity you will get a response back most of the time I'm, i've been really surprised by that ever since i started my youtube journey I've, I've made a note to reach out to people i really look up to and i've i've always been shocked by like specifically email like if you do things on facebook or twitter or instagram it gets lost but if you can find their email, they will get back to you. Like for instance, I, I have almost 3 million subscribers on YouTube Let's go. and I don't get that many emails. I, I'm, I'm able to read all the emails I get, 
My email is right there on the YouTube channel. Anybody can email it. I probably get like no more than 50 emails a day. Definitely no more, but it's not a, like, it's not a, a number where I can't read them all. But you know, yeah, of the 50, yeah. how much of it is like spam or is it like legit unique emails from uh, individuals reaching um, out to you? They're, they're all over the place. Like probably five emails a day are from people that want to sponsor the channel, which is kind of cool, but I, I always ignore those. And then maybe there's like <laughs> 20 from fans that just, or people that watch the channel that want to send me an idea. And I, I get like some of my best ideas from them. Yeah. Right. So like, I and I, I've emailed and vice versa. So I've emailed people I really look up to and it's pretty cool when they give you a response. I agree. And it can be very, very helpful to I think this is a good way to tie off Leap of Fate. I'm not sure if there'll be an episode 101. I'm thinking about starting a new podcast that's sports specific, you know, talking head, talk about the key sports of the day, the week, things like that. So this may be the end of Leap of Fate. If this is the end of Leap of Fate in the way it is, I want to thank you. I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody out there for watching, listening, commenting, whatever you may have done. If you watch the clip on Instagram with the sound off and you just read it, then my effort was worth it. If you watch an episode at one point or listen to an episode for two seconds, anything, then it's worth it. And if you took anything away and it made an impact in your life, then it was worth it. And I'm excited for this next chapter. This one chapter is closing with Oyster and it was amazing. This one chapter is closing with Leap of Fate, but there's a new chapter starting, a new era in Randy's life. The dirty 30s are here, baby. Let's fucking get Let's it. Go. Let's fucking get it. So thank you, everybody. We'll do it one last time, Mark. Repeat after me. Stay healthy. Stay well. Stay wealthy. And have a good week, fans, or a good year, or a good life. Deuces. Deuces. See you on ESPN. <laughs>